So I'll take you back to 1995. I was a graduate student studying at Seoul National University. Uh, I had been there for, what, six months. It was, in some ways, a rather challenging experience for me. Uh, Korea, this is, of course, a little while ago. Well, it was a rather difficult place for a foreigner like myself to live. And I felt a little frustrated, I have to say, uh, by the overall experience. There I was, trying hard to learn Korean. I know I didn't speak it very well. Uh, and I found myself constantly in a sort of similar series of conversations in which the Koreans would say, and some of them would try and speak to me, although not that many, uh, they would say something like this. Where are you from? Uh, well, I'm from the United States, or Migu, as we say in Korean. Uh, then they would ask, well, uh, uh, how long have you been here? Uh, I would tell them. They'd say, well, how much longer will you be here? This didn't seem like an entirely friendly question. Uh, and then maybe we'd talk a little bit about uh, kimchi, uh, something I'm still trying to eat. Uh, and then we would uh, end the conversation. I made an effort to get to know some Koreans, and in fact, uh, a bunch of students from the university took me on a trip. We went to see a couple temples, uh, but essentially, I found it almost impossible to talk to them. So I wondered, I'm of course trying to learn Korean, I wondered how, how could I sort of break through uh, and get to know this country. Along the way in this process, this is now end of December, I decided that for New Year's I would take a little trip. I got on a crowded bus and went down and eventually ended up uh, at a remarkable place, a temple called Heinsa. Uh, in the Kaya Mountains above Tegu. Uh, and I arrived there on this bus. Must have been around 9 o'clock in the evening. A little bit tired, not really sure where I was. And I started to wander my way up towards Heian Temple when I was grabbed by a middle-aged woman, which we technical term is an uh, ajima. Uh, and she took me into her uh, little... Uh, a uh, hotel there, they call it a minbak, it's a little hotel where you get a little piece of the floor to sleep on. Uh, and then I settled down. I found a little place to sleep at least. Around me were various Koreans. I sat down with some of the students there who were frying little bits of uh, pork on a little grill they had brought with them and drinking some of that delicious uh, substance known as a soju. Uh, I'm not sure what the technical term for it is, but uh, I tried a little bit and tried to talk to them, but uh, I didn't really fit in. Uh, I, I should say, by the way, that I was a little bit different than your average uh, uh, American who washes up on the shores uh, here in Korea. There are some foreigners who come here uh, as English teachers uh, to teach English all day and then go out and, I don't know, get drunk at night. Uh, that wasn't really me. Uh, and then there are those in the military who come here to uh, practice artillery and then uh, go and get drunk at night. Uh, and that wasn't really me either. Uh, then there were missionaries, of course, who would go around and sometimes with tags uh, and try and uh, uh, talk about uh, uh, rather abstract things. But that really wasn't me either. So a lot of Koreans had trouble sort of placing me. Anyway, I went back to my little spot in the Minbak under Hain Sa Temple. Uh, and uh, after reading a little book and a little bit of a book I had with me, uh, I fell asleep. I fell asleep. 
and I had the most vivid dream. There I was on the first floor of the Vermeer apartment building. This is in Manhattan on 7th Avenue, if you're familiar. This is where my grandmother had lived. I remember it vividly as a child. And I was running around on the first floor in the lobby looking for my grandmother. I asked the doorman, a very sweet man, and he had no idea where she was. I ran out to the elevator banks and looked in all directions, but she wasn't there. And then I ran out the front door of the Vermeer, right onto a crowded uh, street known as on 7th Avenue right in front. But I couldn't see my grandmother anywhere, and I was getting worried. Where, where is she? Where did she go? And then I came back in. I talked to the doorman for a minute. I turned around, and there she was, coming in the front door, her arms loaded with groceries and bags of various goods she had bought. And when I saw her, when she saw me, she put down her baggage, she opened her arms, and we embraced. We embraced, and at that minute, at that moment, I felt myself in a sort of a strange, how would I say, a strange state of sensation of changing from one environment to another, and slowly I found myself back in that little room in the tiny hostel, the Minbak, beneath Hayensa Temple. But when I woke up, it felt odd to me. This is almost midnight, by the way. I felt almost as if my grandmother was there with me. And I sat there sort of puzzling because there was something odd about the dream, something odd about this particular dream. And it took me a while, maybe an hour or so of thinking, and I had eventually uh, sort of woken up and talked to a couple people there in that little room. But I put my finger on what was odd at last. My grandmother, her name was Hortense, Hortense Cohen, originally. Hortense means gardener in French, and I think she was like a gardener in many respects. My grandmother died my first year of college. She had been ill while I was in high school, and she died of cancer. I think she died at the age of 69, and of course, this is many years later. But the woman who was, appeared in my dream the woman who I hugged when she came in the door of the apartment building. This was a much older woman, a woman in her 80s, I think. It was oddly as if my grandmother had been alive all that time, and then I had met her again, as if she had been with me. That was the odd thing about the dream. Anyway, I finally fell asleep. And I woke up the next day in a very beautiful day, beautiful weather, beautiful blue skies. And I looked around all of the temple there. And I saw, of course, the ancient Buddhist scriptures, which had been preserved for so long, the embodiment of technology in Korea. And then I got back on the bus, went up to Seoul. And of course, my dormitory the same old dormitory. Uh, Seoul had not changed overnight, but oddly, all of it felt more familiar to me. Suddenly, well, you could say my Korean got a little better, uh, but I started to make more friends there. I started to feel a certain sort of a sympathy for Korea, for what Korea had experienced, both in a historical and cultural sense, uh, but also to feel that somehow there was a little space in that Korea that I encountered, a space that I could occupy. Not only that, within a few months, I had met a woman who I would eventually marry. Uh, and the whole sort of uh, path of my career uh, tilted oddly. 
uh, from that moment, from that moment. Now my grandmother, Hortense, the gardener, like a constant gardener, I think, she was a very unusual woman, uh, and of course significant to me. I mean, many, all grandmothers are significant, but significant because she had such incredible expectations uh, for me. I think she had expectations for my father as well. Uh, but I, I'll tell you a story about my grandmother. Well, maybe I'll tell you two short stories. Uh, the first is, when I was around 10 years old, uh, my grandmother, she, whenever she saw me, whenever I came to New York to stay with her at the Vermeer apartment house, uh, she would give me some candy, uh, give me some toys. She would spoil me, you might say. And then when I was 10, suddenly, nothing. <laughs> Cold turkey. I would see her, she would be nice to me, but she would not go out and buy me special toys or take me to shops. Uh, it became serious suddenly. And I realized that my grandmother, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to advance. Let me, let me show you my grandmother. So this is the title. There. There's my grandmother with my father as he looked when he was about a little couple of years younger than me. Uh, and that's me uh, as I looked uh, when I was nine or so. Anyway, so back to my story. Uh, so my grandmother was like that. She had decided that at the age of 10, things have to change, that she had to treat me in a different way. And she did another thing soon after that. Uh, I received a package in the mail from my grandmother. I was very excited, of course. I thought it might be a toy, a game, something fun to do. I opened the package, and it was a big package. And inside were about seven heavy, thick books. History, a couple very difficult 19th century novels, uh, and something about, uh, I think, uh, a science. Now, I won't say that I actually read all these eight books that she sent to me, uh, but what I will say is uh, that it had a profound impact on me that my grandmother expected that much of me. She seemed to have this vision of what I could do as if she was constantly watching me, hoping that I would follow along uh, this path. Now, as I got older, I think I lost sight in a way. I'm not really sure exactly what my grandmother had uh, in mind for me. But there I found myself uh, in Korea uh, in a rather busy environment. Oh, here's a little humorous one. So this is a picture I took uh, when I was in graduate school of my sort of uh, pretending to be a visionary. So I had this, this great idea about the role that I could play in the world. And of course, it was a joke. Uh, this is my old apartment, by the way, when I was at Harvard. Uh, but in a strange way, although it was a joke, uh, it was related something somewhat uh, to what my grandmother uh, had uh, offered to me, the sort of seriousness with which she looked upon me and what I did to give me the books, to have the expectations of me of some sort of maturity. So the fact that she came to me in that unusual dream that one day at the Heyensad Temple, uh, this was of the ultimate uh, significance for me. Its true meaning for me, just go back. Uh, its true meaning for me, I think, is one uh, which is unending. That is to say, there's no final conclusion, final moment at which it's over. And I keep asking myself, even now, uh, what part of this life experience of mine uh, goes back, can be traced back to my grandmother's ideas, her own plans uh, for me, and of course, uh, I don't know the answer to it. Uh, but I'll, I'll tell you one more sort of interesting story about my grandmother. And this is, of course, from the perspective of my father. 
for whom she was, of course, a mother. He, he tells me the story, and I, can, I saw this myself, uh, that of the three sons of my grandmother, my father and then my two uncles, uh, all of them were convinced uh, that my grandmother loved them not equally, but that loved them more than the other two brothers. This is actually quite an amazing feat. And I think about it all, my, all the time with my own children. How did she manage to do that for each one of her sons, to make each one feel as if he was the most beloved of all? And there was something of that uh, that I felt myself in my experience with my grandmother. I didn't spend a lot of time with her, uh, but as we all know, the amount of time you spend with somebody uh, is not particularly important at all. But it was that moment at which I happened to come to meet her there in Korea and to hug her in this faraway country that suddenly it was no longer so far away. And since that time, I've ended up spending quite a good amount of time uh, in Korea, here in Korea, and it's not far away at all. In fact, in some ways, it feels very much like home. Thank you.